In this video, we're going to talk about myelograms. We'll talk about why you might do them and specific techniques you might use. Now, myelograms are typically being done when the patient has a contraindication to MR, such as a pacemaker, some sort of metal implant, or too much hardware artifact from lumbar spine hardware. Uh, they're often done as pre-surgical evaluation, and in some specific scenarios, you might do a myelogram to evaluate for a site of CSF leak. So myelograms are essentially specialized versions of lumbar punctures where after you've completed the lumbar puncture, you inject contrast for imaging, either of the thecal sac or the CSF uh, within the brain. In the case of myelography, you're doing it for imaging of the spine to evaluate for spinal canal narrowing. In CT myelography, you're gonna use iodinated contrast. You can only use spinal safe preparations, so those typically are the ones between concentrations of 180 and 300. We use OmniPIC, although there are other branded versions which are also safe. You'll note that OmniPIC 140 and 350 are not included. That's because the osmolality is too far different from uh, CSF, so the risk of seizure is higher. The amount of contrast you can use is dictated by how much iodine you can safely inject. That maximum is 3.06 grams. That's less in children where they get weight-based dosing. A nice framework, though, that you can remember is you can use 10 milliliters of OmniPake 300. In general, if you never use more than 10, even if you're using 180 or 240, you typically get okay opacification of the thecal sac uh, without worrying about giving too much contrast. However, uh, if you look at the dosing of these in the package insert, you'll see that's a little bit more than 10 that you can safely give. MR myelograms are specialized versions of myelograms, which are most often done to look for CSF leaks. In those cases, you can inject an MR contrast agent. Uh, you can use Magnavist is the one that's been most described, uh, but at many places they've started to use Gadavist. In these cases, you want to inject uh, between 0.1 and 0.3 milliliters of the contrast agent, diluted in sterile saline or contrast or CT contrast and uh, then you'll do fat saturated T1 imaging in all planes to look for CSF leak. Now there are a number of contraindications to myelography and if you look at some of the uh, some of the older books and papers especially there's quite a long list of uh, agents that decrease the seizure threshold. Here you see just a small subset from neuroradiology requisites. This is largely uh, been decreased in the area of more modern contrast agents. Uh, the risk of seizure is still quite low. Uh, most places now are not worrying too much about these uh, because the risk of seizure is quite low. If you see a patient that's on this and they can safely come off of it, then that's something you can consider. Otherwise, you should just counsel them that uh, there's a slightly increased risk of seizure from the procedure. Now, one of the top tips I can give you is that when you go to start injecting your contrast agent, you can puff in a little bit of contrast and you wanna do it with fluoroscopy running and you wanna see that contrast dissipate quickly. It's almost like adding a single drop of food coloring to water. So here I've taken, you see like food coloring kind of dissipating in water. If you wait for a few seconds, this is really gonna mix out a lot because of Brownian motion and uh, you're not going to see a whole lot. That's how you know you're in the thecal sac. If you see contrast clumping up around the tip of the needle or anywhere else, you know you're not in a good location. So here I'm showing you an image and uh, this is a patient who has hardware. You've uh, got your needle in place and you've taken the stylet out and you see flow of CSF. And uh, what you wanna do is widen your field of view. So open it up craniocaudally, uh, connect your tubing. And anytime you make a connection with your needle, you want to make sure you're solidly holding the needle hub with your hand because the easiest way to make a mistake is to move the needle either too deep or too shallow while you're making your connections. Now as you're injecting you want to slowly inject uh, just a little bit. So here you see the tubing is now attached and you see a little bit of increased density here compared to what it was before. And again as I mentioned you shouldn't see any clumping around it as you're doing that injection. Then you wanna just continue gradually injecting at a rate of about a milliliter every 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, you wanna use fluoroscopy intermittently so you can just step on and off the pedal to see as your contrast is going in. 
what you're going to see is additional uh, spread across multiple levels. So here you see the contrast going all the way up to T12 here where the last rib is. And then you also see filling defects created by the nerve roots of the cauda equina there. Uh, you'll also see the nerve root sleeves. So you'll see little owl pouchings underneath the pedicles there. Those are all clues to let you know that you're in the fecal sac. Then finally, you want to keep injecting until you've given your desired dose of contrast. Then disconnect your tubing, replace your stylet, and take out your needle. So this is typically what it's going to look like. Again, you see uh, little uh, owl pouchings of the nerve root sleeves, filling defects from the descending nerve roots, and then it's crossing multiple levels there. Uh, here's just another patient uh, showing you a similar injection. So here you don't have hardware. So again, you see the kind of nerve root sleeve out pouchings. You see the filling defects from the nerve roots themselves. And then you see the contrast spreading along multiple, uh, multiple levels. Uh, once you're done with your injection and you've taken your needle out, you want to do some positioning to uh, mix the contrast, to, so to move the contrast to wherever you're imaging. Uh, you want to then finish with your radiographs if you're taking them. Uh, in our institution, we don't really take a lot of these radiographs because we really are doing most of our interpretation from CT, and then the patient's going to go on to a CT for their final imaging. Uh, if you need to troubleshoot, you can move to the lateral position. Here's what an injection under a lateral should look like. You'll have a contrast pooling in the, uh, what is the dependent portion of the patient so this patient is prone. Uh, if the patient's on their side, uh, you'll see it uh, sort of filling the entire the entire thecal sac there. And again, you can slowly inject with fluorox fluoroscopic guidance under lateral if necessary. If you start to see an unusual pattern of injection, so here I'm showing uh, you've got some clumping of contrast in the unusual positions. It does you are not really seeing nerve root filling. Uh, there's definitely like some unusual pattern here. Uh, you should stop your injection. In that case, you're probably doing an epidural or intradural uh, injection. You're probably not in the thecal sac. In that case, you want to reposition your needle and try to uh, try to get a better injection. It becomes extremely challenging to uh, make sure you're in the right position, though, once you've injected this much contrast. Uh, so try to avoid that if you can. Uh, here is just a CT from that same injection uh, where you can see there's a lot of uh, abnormal contrast collection, so it's not in the thecal sac. Uh, you're getting it collecting uh, in the dura here. You see it's not in the epidural space, but it's, right, it's actually in the dura, kind of a subdural or intradural injection. You can see it's traveling all the way around. Here you can also get the idea it can move to many levels above where the injection was, uh, even though it's intradural, so that can really fake you out as well. When you're coming to distributing contrast, uh, if you're doing just an MR, I mean a CT myelogram of the lumbar spine, you can usually just roll the patient a couple of times, and that's usually sufficient to move them around. Uh, if you're doing cervical or total spine, I tend to put the patient in Trendelenburg, have them extend their neck. They can either be on their side or prone. Uh, on their side actually works out quite well because it gets out some of the curvature of the spine and you don't have to Trendelenburg them as much. If you're doing it in CT or you don't have a table that tilts, you can have the patient get on their knees and kind of do a downward dog sort of yoga pose where their uh, lumbar spine is kind of up in the air and their neck is lower. That's actually a really effective way of distributing the contrast. One of the biggest mistakes you'll make is just not giving uh, enough time to distribute that contrast. You can use fluoro to see where the contrast bolus is going and if it's far enough. Um, and then you can also do test, uh, test imaging before you do your whole CT. Once you're done, you want to have the patient put on the CT table. Again, as I said, you can do test imaging at a single level to make sure you have the contrast where you want. Uh, this is particularly important in the C-spine where maybe you didn't give it enough time, maybe you didn't get enough contrast up in the C-spine. Uh, if you don't have a good distribution, then you can try repositioning the patient, have them do some additional rolls, or be in Trendelenburg for longer. Once you're happy with your contrast distribution, so what you should see is contrast uh, all around the thecal sac. Here you see the conus and some of the nerve roots of the kind of thoracolumbar junction here. This is a nice looking myelogram here. Uh, then you can complete your entire CT. Then you just have to sit down and interpret your myelogram. So it's going to be very similar to interpreting an MRI. Uh, you're going to do kind of a level by level description of what the degenerative findings are what the uh, size of the fecal sac is, and uh, if there's any areas of narrowing.
A couple of pro tips for myelograms that you should think about. Uh, it's good to drop your contrast before uh, before you even start. Uh, that way you have that ready. Make sure you label your syringe and you can attach the connector tubing. Go ahead and fill the connector tubing with contrast so that can be helpful. Uh, I tell all of our trainees that once they're done with their skin anesthesia just to toss the lidocaine needle. Uh, lidocaine is clear like the contrast agents. It's not good if you do it intrathecal. Uh, I, I mean, that would be a mistake that uh, you'd like to avoid. Uh, so if you just go ahead and throw that syringe away, like you have no chance of ejecting that, uh, no matter how it's labeled. And then finally, we already talked about this, but when you're making your tubing connection, hold the hub in one hand, rest uh, your hand against the patient's back, and uh, that way you've got a good grasp of the hub and it's not moving uh, forward or back in the patient's back. After a myelogram or another procedure, like one of the top uh, complications you're going to see is uh, the patient's going to have a headache. Uh, almost all of these headaches are going to go away within a couple of days. Uh, most of them are due to alterations in CSF pressure. Uh, the contrast itself is also irritating to the meninges, so that can cause a headache. So uh, just think about that. Uh, if you have a headache that's persistent and more consistent with a leak, so it's worse when standing, worse at the end of the day, relieved by lying down, or maybe associated with visual changes. Uh, you have to think about if they have a leak that's going to require additional treatment. Again, the vast majority of those are going to go away within a week, but after about a week, uh, you kind of have to think about uh, would you treat them with the blood patch. Uh, the initial treatment, though, is going to be just reassuring the patient, having them rest and be supine, and giving them or having them uh, drink a lot of fluid, and even caffeine is like, quite helpful for a low-pressure headache. If they have a persistent headache that goes on uh, for about you know anywhere from four to seven days, uh, you've got to uh, you've got to consider doing a blood patch. Now these tend to vary like by institution. At our institution, the anesthesia pain clinic does blood patches, uh, so the patients can go in as an outpatient and get them relatively quickly. At some institutions, radiology is going to perform them. I think if you're in your own practice, it's good to treat your own complications if you can. Uh, but uh, we've just kind of worked out a deal with anesthesia because they do a lot of them. Uh, but I think you need to know how to deal with those and when you might consider it. But in general, I don't tend to do too much for seven days because the patients are generally going to get better. If the patients are considering going to the ED, uh, then you might consider giving them a blood patch to kind of help them get through that. In conclusion, we've gone through a number of basic procedures. We've talked about the indications and risk, things to do about anticoagulation, so making sure the platelets are above 50,000, making sure the INR is 1.5 or less, things like that. We've talked about how to perform a lumbar puncture and a myelogram. In some future videos, we'll talk about more advanced procedures, uh, doing CT-guided procedures. Uh, we can talk about pain procedures and some advanced techniques as well. Thank you for watching our video today. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll check out our other videos on our channel. Click here to subscribe or check out our website on LearnerRadiology.com.